Okay. Welcome to everybody, but especially welcome to Lord Norman Foster and Francis H. that you joined the conference and that you joined this big day for our institute, the Institute of Technology and Architecture, and of course, the NCCR. And I also welcome our vice president, also great honor, and a special honor, our former president, Ralf Eichler, thank you. What a surprise. Very nice. So in that sense, it's up to me to introduce Lord Norman Foster. And I asked him before if 90 minutes would be okay. Then he looked at me and said, well, maybe 60 would be better, but I can do it in five and I won't annoy you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome all members of the conference, welcome members of ITA and also friends. I see a lot of friends around here, interested people, not only in techno technological aspects and uh, in technology, but also in architecture. Because this is when I remember my time as a student here, as an ETH student, that was in the mid-80s. And I remember, Lord Norman, the pound was quite high at that time. In the future, it will be, I think, kind of cheaper. So when I think of the future of Great Britain. But in that sense, that will allow many students from mainland to invade your country. But we did it as students with a high pound. Why? Because we wanted to see desperately Swindon. That's true. Swindon was, for us, was a major thing. But I'm not sure if everybody knows what I mean with Swindon. Swindon is, for me, one of the very important buildings by Lord Norman. Because Swindon is not only the heart of, let's say, high-tech, what we call it high-tech, it's more is architecture. It's a, it's a roof, a tent-like roof built for Renault. It's a distribution center. Out in the country, Swindon, nobody knows that little place. And for me, it was the first time to understand that architecture is not only based on technology, is more, is landscape, is people using it, people coming together. This roof, which I remember, which was nothing underneath, just empty. I mean, the, you have to do that as an architect, just to make an empty roof, because every client wants, oh, I need it, I have to pay for it, what can I do for it, and this and that. But he did it, and I think you can persuade every client and bring through these ideas. And so in that sense, for me, Swindon was kind of a very, very important aspect to learn architecture, more than that. And of course, we follow your work, and it's a magnificent work. You work globally, everywhere, but you're not only interested now in the big scale, as I see, you are also interested in the small scale and in craftsmanship, not only machinery. And I think this can be part of the future. So you're here for technological aspects, for geometry, but don't forget to build a building like this here, we had robots like you see around, but this building is more than a technological star. It's, it's a piece of architecture because it combines social aspects, historical aspects, and technological aspects. When you visit the upper floors, you can see we work together. We don't sit in closed little spaces, cubicles, we don't have to walk through corridors, closed corridors, and then we have to open doors to meet people. It's an open building. It's an open building for everybody. Research becomes quite transparent. You can see everything. You can see the machinery, the arms working. So in that sense, I'm very proud, Lord Norman and Francis H., that you are here, and you're the first ones, and I cannot imagine a better first visitor than you here. So I'm very pleased to hear you and to hear your keynote. Thank you very much to the audience that you're here.
Ladies and gentlemen, having spent the afternoon here, I really wish that I could go back in time and become a student. It's uh, really, truly inspirational. We've had a great time. Um, I'd like to really start off by making a point that I have a passion, an equal passion about flight, uh, and over the years have piloted probably 75 different types of craft from racing sailplanes to helicopters to fast jets, aerobatics. And uh, so for me, the airport as a building type has a particular uh, resonance. And also uh, with a passion for aviation and aircraft, I think in some way it touches the architecture. So that is one debt. Another debt are uh, to those extraordinary individuals in history past who've made possible what all of us do today. So these are inspirational figures. Some of them I've been privileged to know, like Conrad Waxman, Buckminster Fuller, Fry Otto. Um, and so I think that we're privileged to carry on that tradition and to build on those foundations. And here we can see really just one or two examples, whether it's Alexander Graham Bell above Conrad Waxman, whether it's Nervy here, Buckminster Fuller, um, Gaudi with his chain models, uh, Gustavino on the top right, Fry Otto at the top, all inspirational and in some way have made possible what we together will try and share with you uh, this evening. Um, the main protagonist of our talk together, and Francis, you should just say a little about your background because uh, I, th I think it's, it's important because you also come out of aviation in terms of engineering. So why don't you just sure. say a few words? So I, likewise, I'm very inspired by aerospace. I don't know if some of you know, but my original background was as an aerospace systems engineer. Um, but I kind of slipped the study bonds and uh, started kind of working with the Norman 18 years ago. But it's been an incredible challenge um, to sort of take some of the technology we use in aerospace and apply it to buildings. So really, Mexico Airport, I would say, in our short history, is revolutionary concept. What do I mean by that? I think it's only on a few occasions as designers that we can make a step which is a significant change. And perhaps the first change was to question the, in the 1990s, the conventional idea of a terminal. And it was Norman Payne, interestingly, who headed out British Airports Authority as an engineer. And I think there's great significance in that. I don't think if BAA, as it was called, was headed out, not by an engineer, I don't think this step could have happened. And what he said is really, uh, he just got us together and he said directly, I want a new generation airport. I want you to question absolutely everything and to come up with something new and something that will cost less and be able to be built more quickly. So it was kind of mission impossible. If you look at the diagram of the terminal as it was then, if you climbed on the roof, you'd see something like the top left up there. You'd see a load of machinery and equipment, and that would telegraph through on the ceiling below. So it's just full of pipes, and no contact with the outside, and really a gas guzzler, I mean an energy guzzler, because all that artificial light was adding to the heat load, more cooling, more power. Um, so our questioning, if I tried to make a quite long process, very simple, it was turning this diagram upside down, putting all that heavy stuff on the roof, underneath the main concourse, so you could get at it 24 hours a day, 
all the year round, and to let natural light into the building, to give it some joy, um, and also to save some energy. So that diagram became a very delicate umbrella with controlled natural light, structural trees, and typically for this airport as it evolved, as we did more versions, this is a relatively small airport, about 86,000 uh, um, uh, square meters. Is that correct? No, yes. A bit larger than yeah. um, And um, so just to give a, a feel for that, this was a big leap. And this has really become the established model for the terminal. It's been developed since then endlessly with all kinds of variations, even on the uh, structural trees. So the next steps have been, in our terms, evolutionary. The scale has changed, we've refined it, and this is a diagram of Hong Kong Airport. And here we're probably looking about half a million uh, square meters, so it's a big uh, step in terms of the scale. And, um, and also an extraordinary undertaking over some six years to create a landmass for a terminal and an airport for the runways where land doesn't really exist. I mean, it was just chopping down a mountain, spreading it around, uh, and getting the largest dredging fleet in the world to create a man-made uh, island. Interestingly, about the size of, 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 of Heathrow. The next step was a big jump in scale from half a million to 1.3 million uh, square feet. Uh, and this is Beijing, but a development of the same diagram. And the spans are roughly of the same order, around 35, 36 uh, meters. But the same diagram developed further and in the context of China. So something that had symbolic overtones the color of the roof would be the same color as the roofs of the Forbidden City. Um, it would be in local parlance, evocative of the scales of a dragon. So a certain kind of folklore woven into it. Um, inspirational Tempelhof, the great cantilever. This is about a kilometer across, three kilometers long, internal railway. Um, and trying to get the very large airport sustainable, interestingly, because you're comparing here, putting everything under one roof rather than a multiplicity of separate terminals. So although it is large, the largest of its kind, it's also arguably the most compact and therefore sustainable. Which really brings us to Mexico because we're going from a 36 meter span to, at its maximum, 170 meters. That's really five times uh, the scale in terms of its physical uh, ability to, to create uninterrupted, flexible uh, space. And here the big move was to eliminate the horizontal plane of the roof the vertical planes of the glass walls enclosing the terminal and the separate structures that would reach out from the uh, traditional building to the aircraft and to try and find one all-encompassing form, element, uh, that, would, that would bring it all together uh, seamlessly. And, um, and really, that brings us to uh, the recent history, relatively recent history, of our explorations in terms of uh, overall embracing roofs, which starts, in our terms, with the, uh, with the British Museum. And the idea of creating a kind of urban room in the middle of a city that would be a gathering space, a public space, but would also function in terms of being able to allow the five million a year visitors to the British Museum, instead of going from one gallery through another to get to the next, 
would give them the opportunity to be able to access all the separate uh, galleries and reduce the congestion and also create a celebratory space. But Francis, I think you might want to sure. talk about the technical uh, and evolution of, of that through other projects. Thank you, Norm. So this was really one of the, the probably the, the first very complex geometry project we did as an, as an office. We'd done slightly more kind of simple curvier roofs before, but this was the really most challenging one we'd done at the time. This was started about 95 or so. Um, and at the time, we didn't have any skills in-house, so we had to go up to a professor at Bath University, Chris Williams, who did this amazing rationalization of the form. So the entire roof is generated from this single equation, uh, transitioning very seamlessly from this rectangle to an offset circle in, in between, and also taking into account all the structural considerations. Um, I think the outcome was greatly appreciated, but I think the office realized maybe they should, needed some of these skills in-house, which is how I got hired um, back in, in 99. Um, and I was uh, quickly put to work. <laughs> this is uh, Dresden Railway Station in, in Germany. So this was a, a beautiful 19th century railway station that had been damaged in the war. And the idea was to put this beautiful fabric tensile roof over the top. And at the time, we were working with Gura Happold, our structural engineers. But the exchange of data between our CAD system and their analysis was, was very slow. It was very, a very laborious process. So I was asked, could we speed it up? So I, I wrote a, I reverse engineered um, one of their form findings with the software and linked it to MicroStation so we could basically go around the design loop in maybe two hours rather than two days. So this was the first example of doing form finding in-house as opposed to out of house. Um, in incredibly crude technology nowadays, <laughs> but it did the job. Um, I think the next project that was very uh, advanced was uh, Beijing Airport. So here, you know, gigantic roof, three, three, three kilometers long, a kilometer wide, would be very hard to try and design uh, manually. Um, so we, we took our CAD system microstation, very he heavily customized it, so we could generate this, this roof. And to give you an idea, this is this gigantic space frame, um, which was also working with Arabs. They, they kind of did all the member sizing. Um, all handcrafted, this, this entire system is, is manually cut, uh, manually welded on site. So very interesting comparison to what we see to here. But it was the, the challenge here was, to, it was from winning the competition to delivering the airport was only three and a half years. So we had to compress things. And the result, I think, is, as Norman was showing earlier, was, was pretty nice. <laughs> um, and then the, I think one of the final key projects was the Smithsonian Museum in, in Washington. And this was really the first project where we generated the entire roof through code. So I, behind me, I have some, I've got a scroll through of some of the code. This is 5,000 lines of code. Um, only takes in a design service and eight column positions and proceeds to create 120,000 objects in 15 seconds, which you know, would be very hard to do manually. I think what was also interesting was the, the level of detail we could get to. Um, and the, the nice thing was, was as well is it allowed us to exchange information very easily with our structural engineers, so we could go back to having a very close dialogue with them. Um, and finally, it was a good project, a good example of um, custom, mass customization. So working with our contractor, they were, initially we had it rationalized down to every bit of glass was the same and square. And they said, don't worry about it. It can all be different at the same price. So that was very translation deed. So that's some of the projects that have led up to helping us on, on Mexico Airport. So this one, I'm going to hand it over to Norman again. Um, it's, it's interesting to go back in time and to look at a project in the 1970s. And this was uh, the headquarters for an insurance company, Willis Faber, that had relocated um, out, of, um, out of central London. And um, a number of features that were interesting, the idea of creating a kind of quilt, um, uh, an insulating roof of, 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 of grass, but the original concept, and it's interesting if I go back to my sketches of that time, and the key words here in the bottom right corner, but we lack time and immediate expertise uh, at a technical level. In other words, great possibilities, the idea of draping something over that building, which 
gave rise to the concept of something called climatrophis. Um, uh, and so this was, a, this was a dream, and in a way, uh, Mexico Airport is, in its asymmetrical form, um, an eventual realization of that, of that concept. And in one of the early meetings on Mexico, um, which is a collaboration between Fernando Romero, young Mexican architect, uh, who, I, who I chose as a collaborator, as a younger, uh, earlier generation, um, uh, extraordinary gifted young architect with his practice. Um, and he reminded me of, um, of, a, of a system available in Mexico called Geometrica. Um, and that, interestingly, has its roots um, with Buckminster Fuller. There's some kind of relationship in the past from one of the founders of the company, a company which is based uh, partly in uh, Houston, Texas, and, and in Mexico City. And this was a system for creating low-cost enclosures uh, over, uh, over tips, over rubbish, or, 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 but was, it, it triggered some of the thoughts about the, uh, the undulating, all-encompassing uh, roof. It's probably just worth talking a little about the site. Historically, Mexico City was an island in the middle of a lake. So basically, the site is more water than soil. Um, it's very marshy. And, um, and so, as we started to contemplate how you built on this kind of land, given also the seismic uh, conditions, we realized that something that would be very forgiving in terms of movement, not only in terms of earthquake, but in terms of settlement, would ideally be so, so something that was um, uh, touching the, the site very, very gently. And that gave all kinds of clues to the structure and tended to encourage us in the direction that we finally went. This is quite a graphic example of settlement. Over a period of 110 years, the original photograph of this monument on the left, which is supported on piles, and you can see that the land around it has just sunk. And on the right-hand side, you can see all those steps which have, have, which, which have been added. So this is a very graphic demonstration of the way in which Mexico City is on the move. And, um, and I think the engineer Roger Risdell Smith in the practice uh, graphically to communicate uh, some of these challenges um, did this little, uh, this little model here. And this is really what we're showing is work in progress. It's nothing really absolutely definitive, although it is going out to, through the tender process at the moment, but the presentation material can never really keep up with, with reality. So some of the material is, 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 is used to communicate ideas. Um, some of it is more, is more technical, some of it's graphic. I mean, the, um, just looking at the history of, of earthquakes in California, the red line, very intense, short-lived. The Green Line, Mexico City, over a longer period, much more potential for damage. And the prediction in terms of that dotted line, in terms of the worst-case scenario, so really quite protracted and, and, and certainly very challenging in terms, of, uh, in terms of engineering. When I first saw this image, I thought it was the Great Wall of China on the left. But it turns out that it's a railway line that was distorted by the earthquake in 1985. So again, very, uh, very graphic. The key thing about the image that you just saw um, was that it was really a very large number of people all together in one room. So that great crowd was all the different interests, all the teams, 
together, working simultaneously. So it wasn't passing the, the past, it was truly interactive. And that, I think, is, is very important in terms of the way that we work. Um, and here you're seeing really the kind of, perhaps, key representatives of that larger team. You've got Fernando on the right, you've got the lady from Narco, uh, you've got Arabs, you've got the group leaders, you've got Fernando Romero. So, uh, very much about interactive, simultaneous um, working. And uh, in addition to all the technology and ability to make simulations, the role of the sketch in terms of communicating ideas is, is also important. Um, the next sequence I show with a little embarrassment because when I actually did this, I found it very difficult not to kind of smile or, or, or get a little carried away with laughter, but it was to try and demonstrate the principle, the Catalan principle of the hanging chain uh, and the way in which, in terms of form finding, so really I'm narrating to the camera and I'm anticipating that this is perhaps the only way that we can get across to a president who eventually will pass judgment on the, on the project. So it's really taking the, the, the floppy kind of chain, uh, adding glue to it, making it stiff, and then demonstrating the age-old principle from the hanging models of Gaudi and onwards into the future. A very, very simple uh, principle. And, um, and we've since constructed the hanging chain model to show the complexity of the roof as a, as a kind of gravity uh, structure. And um, the brief in terms of the green agenda, very, very demanding in terms of freshwater carbon reduction, uh, reducing the, the waste, and aiming very, very high in terms of a lead rating. And um, the roof is, is really working very, very hard in terms of the way that it pulls uh, air, polluted air, uh, through long pipes below ground, through filtration, and the way in which it collects uh, rainwater at quite a scale, uh, sunlight penetration, um, the reality is that to achieve the, uh, the levels of illumination and the quality of light, we're really a very, very small percentage of that roof is glass, something like uh, 8%. Um, and here you can see, which uh, Francis will be talking about later in terms of its geometry, but you can see the way in which the, the structure is creating these great funnels instead of columns, and those are collecting the water, moving the, the air, and then a whole series of studies around the quality of light, the way in which the building will look from the inside, the statistics on the water, um, the uh, relationship between the government policy in terms of subsidizing photovoltaics, uh, so at no cost to the client, there's a certain significant uh, offset, and then a film, this film was probably done, it's not the latest film, I'll show you, I'll show you that um, towards the end. But this is, again, communicating the feel of your arriving at the airport by car, you're moving through the various systems, the check-in, the security, you're eventually coming into the main concourse, this is the major span, the 170 meters that I mentioned, you have the retail, you move through the fingers uh, and eventually through the finer fingers that take you to the aircraft. So it's one kind of seamless system. It started off as one seamless system. It became a little bit more uh, yeah. complex along <laughs> the way. So the, sim the visual simplicity is still there. But as Francis will explain, um, it's, uh, there's been a huge amount of development work to to achieve this. Originally, it was a single skin. Here you're seeing the, um, uh, the baggage uh, hall, 
and, and moving, uh, moving out to the car to, to go away. And here, a kind of final glimpse of that, uh, of that very, very silvery, almost animal-like uh, skin. Oh, excuse me. Um, this is just a glimpse of that um, arriving passenger by air transitioning uh, into the car at an, upper, at an upper level. So the end of the, the opposite uh, sequence. Um, Bucky was a, a very dear colleague. I collaborated with him for the last 12 years of his life. And I think that, in a way, this says something about beauty very, very uh, beautifully. And I think it's probably a, a good point at which to <laughs> hand over to Francis. Thank you, Noel. So when we started, the challenge I, I set to my team, led by Martha Ziggory, was um, I want this roof to be as beautiful as the British Museum, to be as flowing and as elegant um, as, as possible. The slight challenge is it's a little bit bigger and a little bit more complicated. <laughs> In fact, 90 times bigger and uh, area-wise, but also topologically, it's about 70 times more complex in terms of boundaries. So British Museum was just a rectangle transitioning to a circle. This is uh, 46 circles and, a very and, then, and 21 funnels transitioning and blending together. So a little, <laughs> one of the most challenging ones we've done so far. To give you a sense of scale, that's British Museum and <laughs> that's the airport. <laughs> Um, and this whole system has to be completely flowing, completely detailed. You know, the, it's, it's working so hard structurally, environmentally. Um, so a, a little bit of a challenge. Um, to give you an idea of the, of the kind of constraints we're under, um, we are being sort of pushed down and inwards by the airport planners. They want to do all their aircraft layouts. We are being pushed sort of out by the in, internal, interior designers and the, and the people doing the internal... Um, we have lots of demands on, from the environmental engineers wanting to punch holes in in some places and take holes away elsewhere. So how do we try and manage all this geometry pushing and pushing, pushing and pulling at the same time? Um, so this is just a quick section through. You can see this completely integrated system um, that flows the whole way through, from the, the very small fixed link bridges all the way through to the massive main uh, area, uh, 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 sorry, retail area all the way through to the front, um, but the whole system has to read as one. Um, so I'm going to go a little more technical detail here. <laughs> um, so started out, we're looking at kind of you know, driving everything off the Voronoi diagrams from the, from the funnels, but end up with a very strange mesh. Um, and the mesh is absolutely critical in terms of downstream form finding it digitally. So we end up using as, as, as a PTQ method of which gave us a very smooth mesh, but allowed us to handle all the irregular positions of all the funnels and of the link, the link bridges. Um, and this actually, this is not one single mesh. Um, in order to get the control, we need to have to break it down to three parts. So you start with a, a very rationalized perimeter. This is for cost reasons. This is also to enable us to seamlessly plug in these fixed link bridges. Um, these are all standardized. So only the transition zone is, is, is different. Um, we then have um, a series of, um, sorry, yes, we optimize the curvature of the, of the in-between parts. And then for the main torso, we basically um, define it mathematically and then we dynamically relax it. So there's three functions to give it its shape and its smoothness and its curvature and also to pull it down where we need to. The whole point being is that if you just form find from a flat surface upwards, it's very uncontrolled. You get a lot of variation in triangle sizes. And we, we must have very, we really needed consistent triangle sizes. Um, so all these height functions basically led to a very re relaxed starting surface that we knew would form find very, very well. Um, so you can see sort of some of the interior images. And then we using uh, grasshopper and, and kangaroo. So thank you, Daniel, who's in the audience somewhere, <laughs> um, to form find it. Um, and then at, that's the global level. Then we have to fine tune things at a much more local level. We, want, we wanted the funnels to lean over but not have negative cur curvature. So a lot of fine tuning there. And then even smoothing down on the, on the funnels themselves. You probably didn't, didn't see that. The, the key thing with the, fab with the sizing 
is the, is the fabrication. So the largest panel that can be made in Mexico, the largest last glass panel, is two and a half meter wide. So that drove the entire meshing of the airport. That in turn drives the depth of the tetrahedral space frame, so that everything is hanging off that. Um, at the same time, we did a lot of work doing custom algorithms to take this, this gigantic mesh, smooth it out so we could evenly place skylights on it. Um, and also resolving what happens at odd valence nodes. So normally with a tetrahedral mesh, everything nicely drops down. With odd valence nodes, you end up with a, with a, 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 a quadrilateral. So we tried a number of different techniques where to hide this and eventually decided to hide it in plain sight in the top of the funnels. And actually does a very good job guiding the water down the funnels um, and it becomes more of a feature than a, a problem. Just to give you an idea of how big this roof is, you lay out all the space frame members end to end, you go from Mexico City to Memphis. Or to, to put it in more local terms, it would completely reach the whole way around the Swiss border. <laughs> with some, <laughs> so that's 158, sorry, uh, 1800, 1858 kilometers uh, long. Um, but we, we like to also kind of make this structure as efficient as possible. I'm going to hand back over to Norman now, who has an interesting observation to make. Yes, I mean, we compared notes um, uh, about a question that Buckminster Fuller, when I took Bucky to the Sainsbury Center, and we sat uh, in the main gallery, he casually kind of leaned over and said, Norman, how much does your building weigh? And, of course, I hadn't got a clue. Um, and um, when he'd gone and, um, and I was back in the, in the office, I got everybody together and I said, we've got to find out how much the building weighs. And everybody looked at me, you know, as if I was crazy. Um, and we did all the, the sums. And I wrote back to Bucky and, of course, every exchange with Bucky, you always learn something. And what I learned about the exercise, and this is a, a, the start of the, of the letter, um, and when I analyzed it, I realized that the big volume of this building, which is, what, 90% of the volume, weighed something like 6% of the total. All the less pleasant areas in the basement were accounting in mass for most of the weight. So that was really quite a, quite a lesson. And so Francis really picked up on, on that and said, I think we're making progress because <laughs> if you look at the the weight in terms of Mexico, it's not 6%, but actually when we come to the kind of pi diagram, it's 5%. But it <laughs> is, again, I think a very, very graphic demonstration about performance, joy, beauty, lightness, um, doing more with less. Um, part of the original presentation, um, at the time, that it was a competition and we were presenting to the jury and we were trying to uh, think how can we get our, our message across. So in terms of buildability, this is um, an excerpt from uh, that video. Uh, Francis stops it short so you don't see that at this point in time it was actually a single uh, skin uh, membrane. It's, um, it's since developed in its uh, complexity. I would say in its richness. Um, so, so here you can, uh, you can see that, uh, that construction process, really making the point that it's a very buildable building that you, uh, you, you, you really can deploy in terms of the, the big shell with the limited number of components. It's, it's, it's really good in terms of buildability. Um, I think the most recent movie still always out of date, showing you arriving here, and perhaps, in a way, um, moving on something like about six months in time, and um, developed a certain richness in terms of the 
uh, subtleties of the geometry, the transitions. I think that the, um, our, our hope is that it will look extremely simple um, and will not reveal the extraordinary complexity um, and, um, and a lot of the challenges and the hard work that Francis and the team and the many people who've uh, contributed to the, to the venture. So um, that's really ending by paying tribute to, to everybody who's been involved in the project. So thank you. Quite reasonable timing, I yes. think. Um, questions? Questions? Um, if we're having questions, maybe Martha should come up, but she's yeah. not wired no, up. Well, she? Martha can join us. We can, she can speak on the main. Do you want to introduce? Yes, yeah, so I'd like to bring up Martha Tsigari, <laughs> the other partners in my team. So Mar Martha's been the, the primary person in our team working on Mexico City. So if you've got any hard mass questions, sort of <laughs> direct them this way, medium mass questions this way. And <laughs> easy, easy questions this side, <laughs> difficult questions this side. <laughs> <laughs> They're far better than they say. It's a sliding have. scale. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've stunned them. <laughs> Be brave now. <laughs> ah. I just wanted to ask a question about the ventilation system. It yeah. reminds me of the Houses of Parliament, which has got an underground passage and, and a chimney system to draw the system. It famously failed completely. How sure are you that this thing is going to work? <laughs> 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 well, um, it's, it's not the first of its kind that we've, uh, that we've engineered or been a party to the engineering. I mean, the Reichstag is working on similar principles, and there are really, I would say, a body of work that is, is, is rooted in those concepts. Do you want to talk a little about... Sure, and it, it's, it's also a very distributed system, so if one part fails... We can, we can immediately sort of switch that, close down that vent and, and switch over to other ones. So uh, I think they are, we have, the, we have the track record of delivering them. So I think not to worry, Liza. <laughs> I think the other thing about the kind of Houses of Parliament thing is that it, I, I suspect it's perhaps, and I'm not speaking from deep knowledge on this, perhaps it's a little bit like the Reichstag. The Reichstag started with an extraordinary system of natural ventilation from below that was pioneered by uh, an engineer, an American engineer at the time. But uh, over time, things get modified and changed. And I just wonder whether uh, the system that you say failed, in its purest sense, I wonder whether it really did uh, fail in that sense. Of course, um, again, that history is inseparable from the whole story of, 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 of the Thames and sewers and Bazalgette, who created the extraordinary sewer system because of the stench in Parliament. Parliament couldn't function, so they had to do something pretty drastic. And Bazalgette, of course, created holistically the design for the embankment. He married it to a sewage system which was twice the size that London needed at that time, so he anticipated growth, um, combined it with public transport below the embankment, um, the kind of thinking that I, I think some nations need today, badly. Indeed. One last point on that, Lars. No one was alluding that this whole airport floats on a giant hollow concrete raft, and that also gives us a huge amount of, of opportunity to service from below, as, as, the, as the diagrams. So there's very, unlike with Hazard Parliament, we actually can get access to all the equipment as well. It's a little bright, so please stick your hand up. <laughs> oh. Uh, Dr. Foster, has computing changed the way you conceive of architecture? Um, I think you might get different answers from, 
from each of us. For, for me, I think it's, it's, it's an extraordinary tool, but it is a tool. Um, it's a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. I think it gives the ability to inform finding, to explore uh, a whole range of options and possibilities uh, very quickly. Um, but, uh, but if I go back to that second image of those extraordinary individuals from the past and people like Gaudi, um, would they create more interesting architectural uh, masterpieces with the computer? Perhaps they would. Um, but in the end, I think that the computer is as good as the individual who's, who's operating it. Um, it's a very sophisticated pencil. But I, I, would, I would agree. I think you, you, you need that human intuition combined with a computational rigor. I think the one thing it's maybe allowed us to do is, is speed things up. Yes, so that, you know, dramatically. We're, we're, to, to yeah. explore options and to be able to, to visualize and, and, and experience. But it is, it is interesting that if I go, if I think about the presentations that I've made or been part of, uh, of the team making those presentations, if I go to the very heartland of computing, if I, if I think about the presentations that we make on Apple that started with, with Steve Jobs, they're almost totally analog. They're physical models. They're physical models and mock-ups. That doesn't mean to say that the computer doesn't play a major role in the development of the design. Of course it does. Uh, and it enables us to do things again, more quickly and in more depth than we perhaps would have done uh, in the past. But, um, but in, that, in that digital world, it's interesting, the, the dependence on the, physical, on the physical model. And for me, the, some of the best uh, visualizations are still photographs of very accurate models. And somehow they still seem to have something that the computer hasn't come up with yet. I, I agree, Martha. You need other. I think computation, computation is a facilitator. If you're a good designer, you will be a good computational designer. And if you're not, you're not going to produce anything nice. It's garbage in, garbage out, right? And actually, it facilitates bad people produce bad design. <laughs> so <laughs> I think. There is much more to architecture and design than the tools themselves, and the tools should help us go where we imagine we can go, uh, as Norman has very nicely shown with this project, rather than driving us to routes that we don't understand. I think that the, 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 some of the real uh, benefits are the ability to be able to predict yeah. movements of air, acoustics. I think those, as, as, as well as the visualizations, I think those are. Uh, those are enormously valuable. I mean, we, you know, we can explore and test reality in advance of reality. But it is still, having said that, if I think about our project for Bloomberg headquarters, which is a very deep building and where we are naturally ventilating it, and the real innovation there is to do natural ventilation in very, very deep spaces. And to prove that, We've, we ended up building a huge research facility in a, in a warehouse with all these rather like crash dummies um, in automobile things, but, 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 but these um, monitors at desks um, and simulating the conditions around. So even with the most sophisticated um, uh, research in terms of computing uh, abilities and capacity, we, we're still down to physical modeling. Yeah. I think there are a lot of, uh, what it really helps there is when we have conflicting criteria. And in that case, sometimes being able to do an analysis that can sort through them is good. But Francis and I have been years and years in the office and many times we write, run this sort of very complicated analysis and a very talented designer is able to tell us what the result is going to be before the machine spits it out. So. I think there is an interesting fine balance there that people need to take into consideration.
These are quite crisp arguments about education at the end. What would you suggest should be changed in architectural education? So we use these tools. We are able to use computation, architectural geometry. It's all elements. We are into it. I see you work interdisciplinary. But would, would you change anything in the, in the classic architectural education? I'm not uh, as close as Francis to a scan of the, of the schools. Um, we do have something quite special in the practice, and that is a, a concept that another young architect and myself kind of uh, entrepreneur, and that was the idea of something called the graduate show. So uh, anybody who's joined in the, in the last year gets to pin up their schoolwork, and that becomes a big social event, and everybody has the same amount of space, and, um, and we have, you know, drinks and wine and beer and, and, um, and move around, and everybody presents the scheme. And there's an extraordinary, um, extraordinary diversity and, and range. I think that, that, the, that the schools that are, for me, closer to uh, the reality and the practicalities of, um, of building, and I, by reputation, the school here has that closeness. Um, and is still, I think, very much rooted in the making of things. Um, so I think it's, it's somehow the marriage of uh, perhaps for a period in your life where you're not constrained by real-life issues, but it is balanced by an understanding that a building is made. And if you don't know how the building is made, then basically, as a designer, you're less effective. And... I think that um, it's, it's again it's a generalization, but but many people who come into the practice from schools, um, it's almost as if they go through a re-education uh, process, um, because I think there is a, a very big gulf in some schools, and I, as I say, by reputation, not this school, um, between reality practice and, and a kind of visionary future. But you're, you're closer, you do more teaching. <laughs> I, I think you know, the, the ideal uh, student would have their heads in the cloud and their feet on the ground. You, know, they, you, you want that, that freedom that you have in an architecture course, but realize that in the day you want to build, produce buildings. Um, I think this, what's so nice to see here is this link from computation and the digital to the fabrication to the realiz realization. And I think it's a trend we're seeing more, more across, the, across the world, and that's been very valuable to us. Um, I think Martha and I both teach um, at various universities around the world, and we always try and you know, stress that link between you know, the, the virtual and, and, the, and, the, and the real. And you know, we bring students in, we show them you know, what, what, what we're working on. So I think that, that maintaining that industry and academic connection is, is very important. And, and it's interesting because um, students particularly the last 10 years, become a bit more and more schizophrenic coming out of school. They don't understand whether they're architects or computational designers, and they actually want to be one or the other. And you can be the Schrodinger card. You can be either one or the other together. You don't have to choose. But there is a mentality behind different schools that push one or the other. And I think it's a combination of the two that empowers quite a lot the design that we do in the office, actually. Mm. I think when we you know, look for people for our team, we're looking for sort of Renaissance people who can do the art and the maths and the engineering and the architecture. You know, they understand materials. We need to understand it, it all to be, I think, to be a successful architect and engineer. Uh, I was very much impressed oh. about the wonderful little drawing of that airport that you made, this pencil drawing. And before we saw some other sketches, and I always think a simple sketch can be so rich. And it can, it's so rich because it's not, uh, it's not as f uh, strict uh, as the computer drawing is. 
and it has space for imagination. You can everything that is missing, you will uh, see it in your mind. And as I deplore sometimes that my students in the last uh, 15 years, they do not draw anymore. They, they cannot use a pencil. And I, for myself, has once uh, 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 remarked that always in the important moments when I design something, I've got a pencil in my hand and a piece of paper. The important things never happen on the computer, but with a, a simple sheet of paper. It's also a fast response. Um, if you take the, the big kind of mega meeting that I, I showed, um, if you want to communicate an idea quickly, then making that sketch uh, is, um, even if it's only a line, is is communicating immediately, spontaneously, um, and um, I, I agree with you, I mean, totally. Um, I think that since the question was raised about architectural education, um, my, the first five years of my education um, was, at the time, it seemed to me was lacking in a lot of the kind of imagine, imagination and freedom uh, that I sense at other schools. I, I, I studied at, at Manchester University, and it was very, very traditional, so I was very envious of uh, students at the Architectural Association, the Polytechnic, uh, later the Bartlett. Um, I was very fortunate to have the combination of that and, and a master's class at, at Yale, where, uh, so, so it was a great combination, but I was reminded of an exercise that, there were two exercises, and that is you could not move from third year to fifth year unless you passed two tests. One was measured drawing, so you had to take a building, literally measure it, the whole thing, and in a summer vacation, from the notes that you'd taken, then draw it to scale. And the other was the three-day test. And so for three days, you're in examination conditions, and you had to design a concert hall, you had to do the acoustic diagram, and you had to do enough, as it was then, half inch to a foot, which is a very large detail, to show that you knew how to build it. The designs were never outstanding. There was a certain ritual about it, but it was a very, very good, um, very good discipline. Mm. I think, not much I can say to that, but I think one thing we are working on is, and I think we're on the cusp of something, is with augmented reality, where I think we hope to make computers as intuitive as a pencil, you know, to have very natural interaction with them. And it's, it's been a long journey, but I think we are on the cusp of, of that. So I, I would uh, love to give Norman a tool that he could be as free from. Well, the, the, there is an, an individual who was around with us uh, in the practice called Narinda Sagu. And, um, and he, uh, he was also the other individual that I was talking about in terms of coming up with the idea of the graduate show. Um, and Narinda is a wizard with a computer mm -hmm. and a wizard with a pencil. I mean, he's incredible. And somehow, um, together, we have, I think, spread the message that drawing and sketching yeah. is important in the practice. And I think Narinda has created life classes and things yeah. like that for drawing. And, um, and in our spare time, we also encourage children from primary schools to come into the practice um, and introduce them to, to the art of drawing. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's alive and well in one small place anyway. <laughs> uh, thanks for your wonderful lecture. I have a question about the architecture. Uh, you, uh, about the icon icon iconicity of the architecture, I think the, the airport is iconic in several layers, and you mentioned one of them, when you see it from above being like a living organism, and also when you see the interior rendering, it, it reminds 
some of the, uh, in the context of Mexico, some of the work uh, of Felix Candela, but building a different time with different material, with different, uh, probably, intentionality. But uh, I also see a little bit of graphic, uh, and it was uh, obvious in the movie that uh, it looks like the diagram was developed uh, with the letter X, or does, was that an intention, or if it was, what was the reason behind that? Um, I, th I think the, uh, that was our collaborating architect, Fernando, getting a little bit carried away with the, uh, with the symbolism. He felt that it would connect us uh, perhaps better with the, uh, the politicians who might be a, a party to, uh, to making the final decision. So I think that there's perhaps... Um, uh, I wouldn't say that the X in Mexico was a design generator. I'd say it was probably a, a post-rationalization. <laughs> anyway, we won the competition, so it, <laughs> it probably had to be good. <laughs> Yeah, I think that perhaps um, with an awareness that there is a reception following this, um, and somebody's just drawn my attention to the time, so perhaps it would be appropriate to perhaps move on to more informal surroundings. We'd be, we'd be very happy to take questions afterwards. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>